Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the place where big conversations happen. And today we've got one of those coming. We've got Majora Carter on the program. Majora, so I'm not really entirely sure how to describe you other than a green, urban, urbanization, better world, better future type <laughs> advocate and activist. How do you describe yourself? I describe myself as a real estate developer and urban revitalization strategy consultant. And all of that comes majorly into play when we're in the middle of a quarantine yes. and we have riots happening everywhere. And both of those tie directly into you, your work and what you're trying right. to do. So tell me right. a little bit more about that before we dive uh, deeper. Yeah, it's really interesting because I born and raised in the South Bronx, which is where I am. Um, I live in a house that's two blocks away from the house that I grew up in. And, uh, you know, I grew up during the time when the South Bronx was sort of considered the epitome, like the poster child of urban blight uh, back in the 60s and the 70s. And, uh, you know, and, I, and it's really interesting because I was led to believe that if you grew up in a neighborhood like the South Bronx, and their South Bronx is all over the country and they come in different colors, but they're basically what we consider um, low status communities. And by low status, what we mean, those are the neighborhoods where there are more environmental burdens, where there are higher rates of people with lifestyle related health conditions. Um, there's more uh, unemployment, there's more people involved, you know, in some way, shape or form with the, with the justice system. There's, um, you know, less access to healthy food options or diverse food options, and poverty is concentrated in those areas. And so what we do, and so when we realize that those neighborhoods, inequality is assumed in those areas, both inside and outside the neighborhood. So if you happen to be a kid, you know, who's identified as like smart kid, you know, you're taught to measure success by how far you get away from those communities. You're led to believe that if you're going to grow up, grow up and be somebody, you've got to leave your neighborhoods. And, you know, South Bronx, whether it's South Bronx or parts of South Bend, uh, you know, wherever it is, we're led to believe that there are communities that will just always sort of be unequal. And I feel like what we're experiencing now with the, the I think, just the epitome of, of anti-Black um, you know, issues just dominating, you know, folks are just kind of tired by the fact that, you know, it's been for 400 years and then some uh, that, you know, there have been people who in, in our country who have just been considered less than no matter what. And, and I think it's just, it's a time where many of us are just tired of all of it. And it really is one of the reasons why I became a real estate developer. Um, I started off in the um, you know, in the green and more of in the green world, which I feel like that's definitely where people like got to know me. And um, it was more about we were dealing with environmental burdens, like our city was literally targeting our community, a poor community of color, mostly black and brown folks here with more environmental burdens, which, of course, had an impact on our health, um, economically, um, quality of life we lived. And it was just like, really? After a while, it just became a really difficult you know, situation to deal with. And uh, so I got involved in it that way um, and started working on transforming dumps into parks and, and, you know, and creating a green job training and placement system that um, was one of the most successful that we've had in this country in terms of getting people engaged in the, the green economy. And, but it became clear after a while that with even with all of the, the work around creating more opportunities in the green space, that if we weren't literally holding on to our own land in ways that created more opportunity for us, then we were going to always be in this position where low status communities like the South Bronx were always gonna be in, in, a, in a place where things were happening to us rather than with us or even for us. And that's why I moved into real estate development. And part of it was specifically to reduce the brain drain that happens in communities like ours, where instead of believing that we're led to believe that we've got to move out of our neighborhoods in order to live in a better one, how do we show that we can create the kind of community that we want to stay in, that we want to invest in emotionally, financially, spiritually, economically. And that is how you, the way you do that is through real estate development. And we're doing it in a way that don't think, it's pretty clear that most um, 
other developers and even definitely activists and and elected officials from communities like this are not expecting um, us to do it. We're saying, no, we want more economic diversity in our community. We don't want to just concentrate poverty here. We don't need any more homeless shelters and strictly affordable housing only for the, the, poor, the, the poorest income levels. There are people in our communities that do have jobs and do have pretty really decent ones and, or, and careers and want to, and we should create housing that matches their income too. We know that economically diverse communities are much more stable in every single way, but we're not expecting our communities to be that way. They're either gentrified or they're considered places where you continue to concentrate poverty and our real estate practice dismisses both of those issues. We're not interested in either one of them. And it's a super, it's a super complex topic. It almost, it almost feels like you're trying to shift that. I mean, I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth, however I do this. So it's almost like <laughs> you're trying to shift the black American dream from getting out to building up to building a better place where we are, as opposed to getting to somewhere that is better. That is exactly what we're doing. That is, that is the exact effort. Mm-hmm. And it's such a, it's such a strange, I, I mean, I mean, fuck, this shouldn't be a problem at this point, but it is a problem at this point. But I know that I've lived a fair bit in Europe. My wife's European. And I can say without a shade of a doubt, if I was black, I would rather live in Europe than the US mm. because I feel like you have a lot less of the, the same issues growing up there versus growing up here, all other things being equal. Hmm. Well, you know, I've got plenty of black friends in, in Europe too. And, and it's, it's tough. It's, they, I think they have a lot more class about it, but it's still happening. Oh yeah. There, there's a reason why I, um, Meghan Markle came back. I speak to any black person in, in, in the UK and they're like, the fact she stayed there as long as she did was crazy, was unbelievable. But anyway, that's a whole other story, but, but absolutely. I do think that I think since America has yet to really deal with the fact that we li- literally live on land that was stolen and, um, you know, and that we literally stole people to create the economy that we have right now, no one really wants to acknowledge and admit that. Um, and we, we call, you know, erecting statues, you know, to, to, to slave owners and folks who fought to preserve a union that literally depended on, um, people being three fifths human, if that was um, okay, and that's a part of our culture, and you know, and instead of just realizing that, yeah, these are awful, painful truths that we have to deal with, it, you know, and just like, okay, maybe your parents, your grand, your grandparents did some of this stuff, but it's time we can we can move forward together, and then recognize that just because you know, it was done to us, we're not asking, you know, for the reverse to happen. But let's acknowledge that, you know, our humanity, you know, has been systematic. How do you acknowledge that? Because everyone says, let's acknowledge, but it's hard to see. I, I think the biggest issue people have is it almost feels like one side doesn't want to move forward. Mm-hmm. The other side wants to move forward without doing anything about it. Right. And that there's never a middle ground between the two. I mean, and that's... You know, it's What's like the middle the, ground. The middle ground is well. First of all, you do have to acknowledge. I mean, it's just sort of like when you're, um, if you're in, in, you're doing a twelve step program, going to AA. I mean, the first thing you have to admit that there is a problem. If you don't admit that, then you can't really move forward. You just can't. And I feel like that in and of itself is is part of the problem. And the other piece is that, you know, white folks, or let's just call it that, because that's. The, the dominant power structure that we're dealing with. I mean, I really do feel that many of them feel like they're going to lose something, you know, by actually acknowledging that the system, you know, has been game to support them for the past 400 years. And I don't, no one's going to come and do like what they did, um, what the Germans did to the Jews, you know, as, as part of, you know, the, like the, the beginning of the onslaught, you know, of, um, you know, of the Holocaust, which is like, it was the urban planners, you know, who went in and said, and would look at, look at nice places that belong to Jews and just like, you know, those are the first ones that should go. 
and so that someone could move into their place. That's not going to happen here. It's just not. Um, so, but recognizing that if you look, even if you look at companies, like big companies, ones that actually have boards that are more diverse are doing better, right? So just like, just let's just look at that or look at the fact that, you know, we know that innovation can actually breed diversity. If you look at it in nature, it's like you don't want monocultures. Like they won't, they don't last long. Um, and, and things like this happen. I mean, we could consider that if we're looking at the fact that, you know, the, the, the dominant culture that's done the best in, in, in our society is now finally, or in, in many different ways, starts to feel like the, the pain of concentrating power in a way that is utterly objectionable to people who have to experience it the other way. You know, if you even just you look at what happened with the, the civil rights movement, I, I'm learning more from, from my friends who are lawyers now who even the fact that all the legislation that was built was allegedly for, you know, to support, you know, our goals and trying to like be more, you know, actually have more quality. And it turns out that there was always, you know, an undercurrent you know, of the, you know, of, a, of an economic reasoning that supported white people more than it did the people who actually were the beneficiaries of said legislation. Like, for example, um, hotel, like the desegregation of hotels was, it wasn't just like, oh, you know, they thought people should have the right to say wherever they want to, if they're paying for a hotel. Um, it was more like, um, you know, both up north and down south, the industries that needed people from out of town to come and work at them, needed them to stay at a hotel. And if you look at the early legislation, it was only for hotels that were close to the highways. So they weren't actually meant to go in town. They were meant to be where they were, do the job and leave. So again, the economic interests were so present in this legislation that was really supposed to be about humanity. So I feel like after a while, like, let's just acknowledge that what we've been doing as a country, you know, has been totally shady. And, and I kind of laugh to, to say it. I mean, not to say that it doesn't hurt, but the part of me is just sort of like, you had a great run. Now let's, let's just try it a different way because I guarantee you, it's like when people talk about how women, you know, rule, run things differently. We do. We will, uh, with um, some notable exceptions, but um, for the most part, I think there is a sense of a lot more collaboration. Like we just want to, our humanity to be truly acknowledged, truly acknowledged, as opposed to like a hashtag or, you know, you know, one of some of the many stupid things that I think, you know, our what many places, whether it's, um, you know, industries or, are elected just kind of do to sort of make you feel better, but really the anti-black bias is, is everywhere, everywhere. And that is why I think about things like Black Wall Streets, you know, and um, the ones in, in Tulsa and in Wilmington who where there were thriving, flourishing Black communities. And it was right after slavery was, was over within, you know, not long after that. And so we know that it's possible to create these, and I'm not even saying they need to be segregated because I like I don't have an issue with um, you know our communities being more um, integrated racially, um, certainly economically. Um, but I get it if they don't want us in our in theirs. I'm fine with that. Totally fun, fa fine. fun fact: the the apartheid, the legislation behind it in South Africa was to protect the, or at least supposedly to protect the various cultures of South Africa. Let's put them all in their separate locations so they don't lose their language and their this and their that so they can each have their own township instead of a wow. city. Wow, wow, mm. wow. Um, fun fact. That's a, that's a, yeah. That actually makes, I can't say I'm surprised to hear that. But um, yeah. But what, what does it look like going forward? So everyone says acknowledge. Very few people propose ideas or solutions is this something where there is a solution is this something where there's an action that needs taken what is yeah, that action totally i mean in in my industry in real estate you know is it it absolutely is about access to capital 
you know, that banks could be a part of, that, you know, a nonprofit, other nonprofit and non-traditional lenders can be a part of it, you know, various, um, you know, whether it's uh, different parts of, of both cities, city, state, and federal government, looking at how do you support, um, and also private partnerships as well, how do you support to get, getting more minority developers in, in the, in becoming developers, because most of it really is a capital issue. You know, like I couldn't do any of the things that I do were, or started to do anyway, were it not for the kind of joint ventures that I worked on, um, because there was no, even though, you know, I'm a Jura Carter and one of MacArthur for urban revitalization strategies and know a lot about redeveloping communities, there wasn't a bank in the, in the world that was going to look at me and go, oh yeah, we think she's great. And, you know, and it wasn't, is if there, and believe me, there were plenty, I had plenty of opportunities where there were white male developers, you know, and who loved the vision, but would not include me, you know, in any of the actual execution. And it, and that happens all the time. And, you know, what we see, or like within the game of real estate development, how so many folks will basically, you know, keep it very, very insular. As, even though there's plenty of work to be had, there's an amazing example um, that I talk about all the time, but in, in um, Philadelphia, there's a, a project called Jumpstart Germantown. And it was started by a gentleman named uh, Ken Weinstein, who's a commercial developer um, there. And he's been doing it for 30 some years. And he was at a public meeting talking about one of his projects. And uh, um, two young black men came up to him and said, you know, we want to do what you do. We want to work in the residential area, but basically it's real estate development. Could you teach us? Which I thought was like a pretty ballsy thing, you know, to just a person they've never met before. And he was just a nice guy and said, yeah, this stuff isn't rocket science. Yeah, I'll be happy to teach you. Word got around. And so he basically gave him the quick and dirty about, you know, how to find a deal and, you know, how to do, do some work. And then <laughs> word got out to other young black wannabe developers that there was this nice white guy who was giving te teaching people how to do this. And, and it was getting to the point where he wasn't getting his own work done because there was just like literally a line of people trying to like benefit from his wisdom, you know, and, and, um, and expertise. And then he realized like, I can't do this. And, but then he also realized that they weren't going to be able to get access to capital. So he built his own fund and put it in a $5 million fund. And he was the first hard money lender for these young folks to get their first deal. And they have a 0% default rate because they, they were able to create a program that actually trained people on how to do this work in Philly. Um, There's plenty of, of real estate blight there. So for him, it was just like, it's good to have as many people as possible working on dealing with the blight here. On a certain level, it helps his properties as well. So because he does commercial property. So it's like, and Lord knows there's plenty of work to do. So I can, if I can get some money out there for these young people to get into the business, their first couple deals, like I can finance them. They're going to pay me back. And I keep rolling that money around to, to give to another person, but somebody else. But then after they're done with me, a bank will look at them and go, oh yeah, yeah. They did a couple deals. They now, now I feel okay lending them money, but there aren't enough Ken Weinsteins out there. And the basic, the basic concept being Native Americans would have been much better if they rented the land to the, <laughs> the settlers as opposed to selling the land for a couple of cigarettes, or well, I yeah. guess it was tobacco at that point. Yeah. And the, the, idea to, the idea today is if you're, if you're growing up in, let's say, South Bronx, mm -hmm. maybe it's a better idea that the people that own the land in South Bronx actually look like they're from South Bronx. Yeah. And, you know, but that's, but, but to your point that what a crazy thing is right now is that there's very, like when, uh, just the 10, maybe 15 years ago, we had a 20% property ownership rate here. And uh, cause there's a bunch of cute little brown stoves, also stuff like that. Now it's less than 7%. Why? Because there's lots of predatory speculators, you know, the, the community, you know, has been led to believe there's no real value here. And the speculators will go and literally knock on somebody's door and go, oh, I'll buy your house um, for cash. And they're like, you want to buy this crap? Like, because that's the feeling that we have, because we don't think gentrification even happens, be, you know, when you start seeing doggy daycares or coffee shops in a, in a community where if you didn't have those things before, um, it happens when we're led to believe that we have no value in our own community. So we sell early and cheap. 
And there isn't a whole lot of efforts, whether on the government side, certainly not on the, the, the nonprofit side either, to really help people see the value in creating and retaining wealth within our own communities. And as a matter of fact, it, we're often con uh, told that, you know, it's almost inauthentic to be thinking about wealth creation if you happen to live in and are from a community like this. And it's like, almost as if poverty is a cultural attribute versus a place you are in your life because of the situations that are happening around you. Um, and so, so our approach, having a, 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 a real focus on wealth creation within our community absolutely puts us at odds with, I think, the dominant theories that seem to run rampant in places like the South Bronx. Why are U.S. cities, when compared to comparable wealth, let's say European cities, mm -hmm. So much, and when you look at violence, when you look at access to opportunity, when you look at education, why are they such shitholes compared to <laughs> comparable countries, cities in other countries in terms of just how much, I, I feel like in, in certain places, you know, as we said, getting out is the success. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't think that exists in other first world countries. Yeah, I mean, and we have it worse here, I mean, specifically because of systemic racism. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Although, um, you know, in white low status communities, you the, the experience is the same thing. It's like you're measuring success by how far you get out. But you add the complication of race, and then those people those people are not really ever going to do any better. So you can build the crappiest housing. You don't. You can have the the worst type of schools. You can basically funnel the worst teachers to places like that. Um, in some cases, you don't really ever have to support the type of, of, of building and, and community infrastructure that promotes a healthy lifestyle. Um, you don't just, you know, and you just don't do it. I, I think about my own, um, you know, the, the main street in my own community, um, which has more real estate devoted to pharmacies and healthcare than it does to anything else. And that's because, you know, in this, in communities like this, there, it's like, we know people are going to have diabetes and obesity and everything like that. So yeah, we're, we'll absolutely reserve space for pharmacies because it's a multi -do multi-billion dollar industry. They make a lot of money off of communities like this. Um, the fact that. So does McDonald's. How do we deal with that? Oh, like yeah. if you can only afford right. cheap food. Well, you, yes, yes. And well, that's a whole other story. It's like, why is McDonald's so cheap often because of the same subsidies that happen to the oil industry? I mean, straight up, it, they, the things, some things should not be that, that cheap. Um, and, you know, small farmers don't get that kind of love at all. And that, so we have to really think about what, like how, you know, our tax dollars are being spent in, in that regard. But again, the other thing that is very clear to us is that, you know, we are led to believe that whether it's the fast food or whether it's the pharmacy, that'll then fix the fast food issue that you get from eating all that crap. Um, you know, that that's normal, you know, being healthy and, you know, craving things like a salad, that's a white thing. Like who, who led us to believe that, you know, especially when almost all of us, whether we're from down South or from or in the islands, um, you know, grew up, are just one generation ago. And some of us, it's not even a generation ago. Like people are literally just came up, um, you know, ag agrarian societies, like straight. So it's like eating pe stuff from the earth is not that far away from us, but suddenly we've been led to believe that that's like not how to do it. Again, who does it help? Is it really helping us and, and our quality of life and our health? No. Not at all. But again, if we're led to believe that that's what you do when you're poor and that you can't possibly, you know, find, um, you know, a decent place to eat, even in a community like this, it's, first of all, it's, it's not true. It's, it's not. But again, there, they, uh, there's also, I think, it, and they're definitely true, uh, some food deserts, absolutely. But like I've noticed as, in this area, and I've seen it in other areas too, the phenomenon where people just sort of like knee jerk, we'll call it a, a food desert, even though 
there's been groups that have been doing great work around bringing food box programs and farmers, um, you know, and, and community supported agriculture to this community. Even my local grocery store, which used to be a piece of crap a few years ago, literally took out a row of their supermarket um, and, and it took just to increase their produce and to create different types that you'd never saw in the neighborhood before. And so I do all my shopping here. And, but it's still, there's definitely, you know, some food justice um, advocates that will only refer to this as a food desert versus going, oh, but wait, we now have some more options. And again, I think when it goes back to like, when we sort of, in, well, not, not me, but when folks embrace the idea that poverty is, is a part of our culture, like, and equate it kind of with neighborhood preservation. So of course you only work to support the people that are poor in your community because that's all they'll ever be. I find that really objectionable, but I also find that it's pretty normal in um, you know, the way both the nonprofit industrial complex and definitely government and even sometimes the, um, uh, the public-private partnerships that happen around here uh, work to create and sort of maintain that idea that poverty is is a part of our culture versus a place where it I think people happens. create it as well though. It's like that one movie title with Jack Nicholas, as good as it gets. And it's uh. when you're when you're living in something, mm -hmm. you have two choices. You can accept it and try to be enjoy it, live with it, be happy with it, or you can either mope or push. So like the, the alternative for people accepting that and doing their best would be to just be cynical and angry all the time, which certainly is not, uh, it's not a good alternative. So there's just so many temptations in human psychology that lead people down that path. There's the, when, when you're overworked, not sleeping enough, making shit. I mean, God, here in Georgia, we have the right to a minimum wage that's below a federal minimum wage. Like wow. all of the all of these little things, because it's right. a right to work state of right, right, right. All all of these things, we only have so much willpower. And the more you're drained from bad food, bad mm -hmm. sleep, right, bad conditions, the right. less willpower you have. It's it's right. it's a self fulfilling flywheel. Right. No, it was interesting because um, I. You know, the last thing in the world I wanted to do you know, after I went away to college or even like, listen, I was planning my escape from this neighborhood when I was seven years old. Literally, that was like the first time I was like, I got to get out of here. And, um, and it was because I watched the two buildings on either end of my block burn down at the beginning of the summer. And at the end of the summer, my brother was, was shot dead because of a gang war. And, and I was like, this is horrible. And I was a smart kid, use education to get out. And when I discovered that I would have to move back home because I, I needed a cheap place to stay. It was such a huge defeat for me to have to come back home and to be living in a place, you know, where there's still were the, the, the residue of, of the burning, you know, there was still a couple of buildings that hadn't been built back up yet. And this was in the, the early nineties. Um, and I was just like, this is horrible. Like, I don't want to be here. But when I discovered that there were, the type of policies that literally created what we deal with here and why you know we've been struggling with environmental issues and public health issues. And I realized the community was created to do this. And I was like, that really sucks. And I can pretend I don't see it or I can do something about it, right? And that's when I started focusing on literally, because I think you're totally right. And you really hit on something where it's just sort of like, you just sort of embrace what's there right? Because it's been sitting, it's been happening there for so long. And, you know, and I think I had some education and some distance and I realized things don't have to be as they are. And that's when I was like, the only thing I can do, because I had very limited resources working with a, a, a small community group around here. It was all about how do you literally change what people see in front of their faces and give them something else to look at just to like make their head spin around for a minute and go like, Oh, is that possible? And that's why I focused on green infrastructure, like transforming a dump into a park and making it so that people felt like, you know, trees could, would, would actually provide um, shade and, and look pretty. And, and it really did make people go, Oh, you know, we kind of needed a little, like something to look at that was nice. And, you know, our neighborhood's not that bad. 
that. And we do have beautiful people and lots of beautiful things. And it was just sort of added that layer to it. And the same thing that we've done here with using real estate as, as that sort of driver now, because um, we realized that people were leaving our community, not because they hated the neighborhood, not because there was high crime, because there really isn't. Um, it was more, or it's more the perception of it, definitely. But it was because people didn't have the things to do that made them feel like their community is worth staying in. So it really was the equivalent of like building a park in a, in a place that didn't have any or making it look physically appealing by built planting more trees around um, and even giving people a financial reason to think that the environment was great by, by giving them a job, by doing it. Um, it was really about where do people go, where do they want to spend their time and their money, and where are they taking their money outside of their community instead of creating a local living economy. And so opening up a coffee shop when we realized that people were leaving to experience, you know, experience like the, the hangout vibe that you can have there. That's why we opened up a coffee shop. Um, we have the first one that we've had in the neighborhood since I was in high school in the 1980s. And it's called the Boogie Down Grind Cafe. Um, and it's the only locally owned, yep, Boogie Down is in, you know, South Bronx, Holla, birthplace hip hop. And, uh, you know, I know ATL's got some serious stuff going on down there. Um, but we, it was really to provide, you know, this, this hip hop themed, you know, really proud place that is deeply ours. Like that is a part of our culture. Like no, no, everybody claims that. Um, and, uh, and it's a really beautiful spot. Like our baristas, you know, we serve like the best specialty coffee. And, um, but we, and they're all DJs in their own minds. Um, and then some of them are quite good. Um, you know, become a place that people really loved being in. And, uh, and it was, and it's also really interesting that, you know, people think of coffee shops as the, the, the harbingers of gentrification and things like doggy daycares. But here in the South Bronx, the first specialty shop, owned by a native black chick, me, and the first doggy daycare owned by um, a Puerto Rican uh, man and, and his husband. And they're also from the South Bronx. So I find that just beautiful. And like this is the, the idea that our culture, our, we, we make our culture and turned it like they were two dog lovers and were just and wanted to open up and always dreamed of opening up a doggy daycare in their own community. So they did. Um, it's called Bronx Sparks, by the way. It's really cute. And, uh, but creating those type of genuine places that people can claim as their own because it's the kind of community that they feel proud of and want to be in is, is super important and not the kind of, of techniques that are often applied, you know, in our communities. Like there's more things like, you know, pharmacies and, and community centers that cater to kids. Um, then there are the kind of social gathering third spaces that make people feel like this is a hot neighborhood that I want to be in. Uh, grass is greenest where you water it. Yes. Triple bottom line businesses. Let's get mm -hmm. into that yep. because I think that's something that you are big on if I yeah. thought correctly online. Yes, you did. You absolutely did. So we're, um, so we've been looking at the idea. Yes. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm a businesswoman. I mean, I, I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I do. And I love doing it. But I also am very interested in how um, the idea of a local economy can actually happen, which means, you know, how are people building wealth, you know, on their own? If they can't own a home, if they're like, you know, if they're not owning a business, are there ways for them to be a part of the, the economy that's in our own community? And so, but so for both our coffee shop, I mean, we had a local investor in it to start, and then we also are opening it up to do a revenue share for, you know, just, to, it's really there to help us as well as we sort of transition into opening after the pandemic. But it was just like, why not like create um, a model through main, it's called Mainvest, which is an internet, um, a crowd, in, internet investing crowd uh, funding campaign uh, platform, which is really amazing. And the idea is that, you know, if you plunk as, as little as a hundred bucks in, you know, you actually get a share of the revenues, you know, for a, a certain amount of time. And so you get a return on your money. Of course you could lose it all too. I mean, that's the whole point of investing. It could happen that way for a much larger project um, right down the street, which will be, uh, that's going to be like a $1.5 million project. We're transforming an old historic rail station 
into an event space. And again, we're looking for you know equity investors using the same kind of um, crowdfunding campaign that allows people to invest um, you know a portion in. They'll so whether they're investing. Um, we don't know exactly all the terms of it, but the point is that whether they're investing, say, $100 or $100,000 into it, they're getting the same rate of return. And the, the idea is that this stuff should be accessible to people. And this is how you learn. So to understand that, like, oh, that's something that white people do. It's like, no, Jose from around the corner did it. And so did Miss Ross from across the street. So why are we not thinking about ways to build our wealth and, and sort of destigmatize this idea that, that, that um, to be in a community like that, if you're, if you're doing anything except being poor in a community like the South Bronx, then you're somehow, you know, being disrespectful to your roots. And, you know, and again, I don't know, or you're acting white or some kind of crazy thing like that. And again, we just point people back to the history. How much do people try to avoid that? I think that's an interesting point because oh. it's not something I can relate to. How much do people avoid? Like, you, you know what I'm saying? And I think mm -hmm. it's a, I think it's a super relevant question. I've totally. never heard asked before. Yeah. I think, you know, I'm glad you did because most people don't ask and I appreciate that you did. It is, it's, it's very relevant, but it goes back, I think, further into, um, I mean, I think even the, the roots of, of our country, right, which, are, which is steeped in white supremacy, right, where in, you know, look, if there had been the kind of slave uprisings that white folks were always afraid of, they would have been wiped out because there were definitely, there were clearly more black people enslaved than there were otherwise. So you had to find different ways to torture us to keep, to keep us from going the, under, right? Um, one of the easiest things to do, one of the easiest things to do was to sort of set up different, um, you know, make sure that you use the people that are being oppressed to oppress the other people. So, I mean, that's like my, my husband, who's, who's also white, um, you know, he's just like, yeah, it's uh, white people have outsourced the oppression of people of color to other people of color. And that's, they've been doing that for a long time. So if you, you know, set up the field Negro and the, and the house Negro dynamic, if there's colorism and, you know, the lighter you are, the better you are, you're automatically setting up this, this kind of dynamic between, between us, right? And, but who does that benefit? But I think on some level, we've all like taken it in. And unless we actively go, okay, I see that and I'm not going to buy it we will drink it in like, like it's the tastiest drink you've ever had. And unfortunately we, what the, when, when we tell each other, it's like, Oh, you know, you're acting white, you know, it's because you're, it, it's because you're like trying to stretch above where, where they say you're supposed to be. It's people, it's people trying to pull you down. It's like when you try to lose weight and you're around fat people, yeah, they, and they pass you the fries. Kind of, but it's also, it's also rooted in fear, I think, because when you did that, you put everybody at risk. And I think, again, like the, the kind of subconscious that still permeates so much of our, so much of us is still there. And, you know, you, you, now you, could, you just have to be like jogging while black, you know, or birding while black. It's, it's people, so the fear is there. And it, I'm not saying it's not real. It is. Um, but I still think it, it's, it's a way for us to kind of, cause I feel like so many of us just automatically feel we're going to be terribly disappointed and history will show us that they're not wrong. They're not. Disappointed but, or disappointing to family no, and friends. Disappointed. No, I, I was saying the possibility of the other as well. There's a bit of both, but if you try, and because chances are, there are truly infamous forces out there. The, the deck is stacked against you and you know you're gonna be disappointed and you're watching somebody you know, who's trying um, to be like, and then on some level, yeah, it does put a mirror on you and you're like, oh, it's, it's showing that I'm not and they are, but maybe if we like, 
if we're sort of, a, if we're attacking each other, and again, I don't even think it's, it's like a cognizant thing. Like, I really don't. I think it's like, it became part of the, the DNA that we take in. But again, we can switch it if we acknowledge it, that this is what's been going on, you know, in our society from the day we landed on the shores here. And it, the, the, the divisiveness that I see, you know, whether it's it, in, in, in black communities or, you know, definitely between black and brown communities, that's a whole other story. Um, you know, it's like, I mean, I feel like if we connected blacks, blacks and, and Latinx folks really got together, it'd be, it'd be incredible. Certainly have some good food and good music. <laughs> that is well, we already have that. Yeah, but, we we can play with the fun stereotypes as long as they're happy, right? <laughs> and then make people, and then under, help show folks that we don't have to, you know, behave as tragically awful as, as we were treated. I mean, I think we could do that. I know we could. Um, you know, How much is mainstream rap part of the problem today? I don't really even know. What, what, what do you mean by mainstream rap? Um, is, I, I feel like as someone who did not grow up in those type of situations, the life that you see portrayed is filled with the pursuit of money, power, and chasing a five letter word that starts with a P. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it, it's kind of, it, it's, it's degrading, at least yeah. from someone looking on the outside, it's degrading, especially if it's aspiring. Yeah. I don't, I, I can't say I'm a fan of it either. Um, and I have, I have yet, and I don't want to speak much on it because I'm sure there's like a reason, but I don't, yeah, I'm not a fan. I don't understand it either, but, um, and I'm sure some of it would, some folks would say that it's just sort of like, you know, the way to just sort of be out there. And I'm just like, okay, I, I, get, I, I get it, but I don't. So I'm not even going to pretend that I'm going to try to, to go there and explain it or justify it because I, I, I can't. Um, but yeah, that is something that I really need to understand a little bit more of myself. The reason I've always heard is because actually most of the CDs and music are sold to the middle-class white suburban kids. And that's what, <laughs> that's what they want to hear. Oh, that's no, that, that I have not heard that. Not sure, that. Not sure if that's true or not. Yeah. But that was what, that and was what I always heard. And that makes me super sad. Um, if that's the case, it's like, well, why? Well, I guess, you know, they do buy a lot, um, but they buy it anyway. Um, they certainly did before. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. Exactly. What so haven't we talked about today that we should? Um, I think well, I'd love to, you know, I think I just share a little bit more about how, what we're, the work that we're trying to do really is based on, you know, it's not creating like our own little, little, the gated community, Africa, black people town. Um, oh, I don't know if that'd be a terrible thing in, in a lot of ways, but I do think that it is about recognizing that our pursuit, you know, of people, the black folks and other people of color toward the American dream, you know, has been curtailed you know, has been literally put the, put the kibosh on it specifically. It's a nice um, way of putting it. <laughs> it's kind of true. Um, you know, through policies and practices that were just, you know, anti-black at their root, but clearly have a, an overarching um, way to support other people of color. And, and I think other poor people, um, when I think of the, um, you know, where Dr. King was at the very end of his life, and if by chance, you know, he had lived, and, and was really a poor people's movement versus, you know, simply a, a, a vision for, um, which needed to happen for equality for black people, absolutely needed to happen and, and not to say that it has completely. But I look at, you know, the fact that you know, he had this amazing quote, which I'm totally gonna butcher, but basically he's like, it's a cruel thing to say to a person you know, who doesn't have any boots, you know, to pull yourself up, but to pull, you should pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Right. And, and it is true, but I would even take it to another level because the current way real estate development works in our country right now, 
and specifically in low status communities, we have boots. Those boots are the talented ones that we essentially teach to measure success to leave our communities instead of helping to rebuild and reinvest in our own communities. Boots are meant for walking. They are. They're meant for walking and staying around and, and you know, shining up and, um, you know, showing other folks how to, how to make them and build them. And, you know, and that's why, you know, I think about, you know, the name of my neighborhood is called Hunts Point, right? And, you know, I think of it when all said and done, when we're finished creating the kind of visions, you know, which includes mixed income housing, mixed use commercial development here, that there will be something akin to a Hunts Point homecoming, where people, many people like me, frankly, you know, because I wasn't the only kid who went to PS48 and I-74, you know, who did okay for herself or himself. Um, there were plenty of them, but they all moved out of the neighborhood in order to live someplace better. And I have this, this vision that some of them will want to be like, I, I want to go back home. Like, I still have people over there. Like, I still love that area. And, but they're not going to come unless we give them something to dream on, you know, and to see their quality of life, um, you know, living up to the, the level that they see it being. And I think that's what I want to see happen around the country as I work on doing real estate development, whether myself or anybody else who thinks about economic diversity, you know, as a, as a tool that we can use to transform our communities socially and environmentally, and of course, economically. And you had one major the misstep there. You said, that's what, what you want to see. I have, yeah. a cha- I have a challenge for you. I think you're thinking too small. Oh. I, want, I want you to case study what you're doing now and then help other towns and cities do the same. Because yes. the, the, there's not a better way to put this, but every city's got a rich black guy who can fund <laughs> the first part of getting this started in their yep. own community. And everyone wants to see things like this happen. Mm. All they need to do is see an yes. example of how it can be done. So if you can yeah. give someone the case study and the here's how you do it, or even yes. better yet, be the person who facilitates it, mm-hmm. then you could create all of those little hubs. That's what I'm working on now. Good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So not, not see that you don't, not, you want to see it happen. You want to make it happen. Make it happen. Oh, I, you know what? I appreciate you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Think a little yep. bigger and talk bigger yep. too. Exactly. Cause you're right. See, as I'm like, I am a very visual person. So yeah, I can see it, but making is a much stronger word to use in that regard. Totally. Thank you. It is. I think you can do it. You've got the background. Yeah. And you've, you've clearly got the, you've clearly got the momentum behind you in terms of what's happening. If, if we're ever allowed to go back outside, that is. But yeah, yeah. So the the spot that we're working on right now is an event hall. Oh my gosh, it's so gorgeous. I mean, it's just just in time for when we are able to go back in, outside next year, early next year. It's going to be hot. It's going to be hot. I can't wait. I like it. Yeah. I think this is a good place to start to wrap things up Okay. so that everybody listening can go and take some type of action. If you wanted to leave people with something, a quote, a call to action, before you tell them where to find you and more about you, what would it be and why? There's a, a, a quote that um, is my motto that's got my, it's at the, at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture um, attributed to me called, uh, it says, no one should have to, you shouldn't have to move out of your neighborhood to live in a better one. And I think if people can just think about that in terms of all the communities within our country that are going through a level of social unrest because of like the kind of racial depravity that's existed in this country for a while, think about what it would be like if all communities could actually believe that. And I hope it softens people's hearts to you know, instead of just thinking of people as, as looters who have no soul, that maybe our communities need to be things that restore us and help us flourish rather than make us wish we lived someplace else. Dystopian movies look like shit when you see the environment. And there's a reason it creates the world. Yep. Thanks for coming on, Marjorie. Thank Majora, you so much. where can people find you, <laughs> learn more about you and what you do? Sure. So there's our, our website, majoracartergroup.com. 
um, and our cafe is the Boogie Down Grind uh, on Instagram. And you're ev you're ever in town, and New York City is open up. Yeah, so check check it out and grab some coffee. Absolutely, yeah. We'll yeah. be actually in July. Actually, we're going to start opening again. Nice. Cool. Yes. Very cool. Yep. Very cool. Thanks for coming on. Thanks Thank for doing you. this, and Peace we'll out. talk to you guys again soon. Thank you. Blessings. Bye bye. Cheers.